expected outcome very clear. At Go Church, we are on the journey of our lives with focus, determination, and drive. And it is imperative that we clearly define the goal, salvation. To get there, we must help you understand who we are and what we are all about. We are building a Jesus community to serve the world. The question is, are you ready to go? Good morning, good morning, good morning. How are you all doing? Oh, okay, looks like we're still cold a little bit. I just want to thank God for every one of you. Thank God for those of you that are here. And for those that are watching us online, we just want to appreciate God for you. We thank you for everything that you do. And uh, for the Tatins tribe, we expect more from you guys. Amen. We're going to put you more. <laughs> we're, we're going to put you under some more pressure to uh, bring out this kind of stuff. Uh, how, how much do we appreciate them? Let's just appreciate them one more time. God gives us um, uh, all the uh, wisdom and the ability to be able to use to the glory and honor of his name. So we thank God for you guys. All right. Uh, first, let me say next week. Do you know what's going on next week? What's happening next week? Okay, how many people have their questions ready? Because I know Pastor Bank is ready. All right, um, please just make your questions, you know, get your questions ready. Let's go. We want to answer every question. We want to make sure that all the ambiguities are clear, if there are any. And uh, God helping us, we should be able to, you know, get some things out also on Sunday. All right, uh, this is the last leg of this portion of Go Next. All right, and um, we're talking about what a Jesus community is, because that is who we are. And if you remember, I will always go back to it. Um, your identity plus your what? Oh my God. I, I've said this five Sundays. This is a sixth Sunday. Your identity plus your purpose leads to what? Predictable actions. And predictable actions always result in what? predictable results or outcomes all right so your identity your purpose leads to predictable actions predictable actions will always lead to predictable outcomes and that's why you have to have a you know you have to have a vision you have to know what you're doing you have to know who you are you have to know um, uh, what you're all about all right so um, um, in doing so, we went on an allegorical journey, right? We're, we're going on an we went on an allegory. We're still on this allegorical journey that we're going somewhere, and every time you are going somewhere, especially a place that you don't know or a place that you don't know too well, uh, something that helps you, especially for somebody like me who has a unique condition, uh, what 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 really helps you out is um, signposts. All right? And in that signpost, it helps you to know where you are. It helps you to know whether you are on track or on the journey. And if you are not on the journey, if you don't see those signposts, you know you are off track. And you can always find your way back based on the signposts. And we said that some of the signposts we're seeing in this you know, uh, journey of the Jesus community is number one signpost that you see is what? Everyone is welcome. Number two signpost is what? No one is perfect, but we're growing. The number three signpost is what? 
You said? Good. We are for one another. Number four. Generosity is a way of life. And then number five. Today. Number five signposts. We are passionate followers of Jesus. Amen. We are passionate followers of Jesus. You see, every signpost I have given you, if this is not included, then you have not just started the journey. Because this is the crowning jewel of all signposts. Amen. All right? If you are not passionate about Jesus, you are not going to find a place in your heart to welcome everyone. That's right. If you are not passionate about Jesus, it's very, very difficult for you to accept that we are not all perfect. You want everybody to be like you. If you are not passionate about Jesus, it's difficult to uphold one another. If you are not passionate about Jesus, it's difficult or almost impossible for generosity to be a lifestyle or a way of life for you. Why didn't I make it first? I did not make it first because I wanted, you know, I wanted to build up until this. This is really, really, really important. Really, really, really important. All right? What does it mean to be a passionate follower of Jesus? What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? Uh, uh, Pierre, can you, can you please help me with that so that I will be able to govern myself accordingly? All right? So what does it mean to be a passionate follower of Jesus Christ? What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? All right? The word follower is taken from scriptures many times, which means a disciple. You see, many of us, when we got born again, we got born again believing Jesus Christ. I'm just rehearsing what Pastor Bank taught us, I think it was early last year, and all of that. And one of the problems that we have in Christianity where we're not able to move or why did Jesus come into us not try a lot of times is because after we get born again, we just park in the area of belief. So sometimes when I hear, you know, they call us believers, it looks uh, reductive in my, in, you know, in my understanding, based on what I understand. It's very reductive in the sense that it just reduces us to something that is incomplete. Is it important for you to be a believer? Absolutely. Without it, you cannot get into the kingdom. But is it enough to stop, being, to stop at being a believer? No. The Bible says even the devils believe and they tremble. So what is the next step? The next step we have to move to after believing is to become a follower, a consistent follower of Jesus Christ, a disciple. Jesus in, gener uh, in, in Matthew 28 told us, he said, go ye into the world and make disciples. He did not say make believers. Yes. He said make disciples. And the question I want to ask you today is, are you still packed only at being a believer or you want to rise to the next level of being a disciple or a follower of Jesus Christ? Because that is where you are going to fully experience all the potentials that God has for you. When you become a follower of Jesus Christ, when you become a passionate follower of Jesus Christ. Why do we have to follow Jesus Christ? Why do we have to be passionate? Why aren't we just waiting for heaven? You know, we get born again, we wait for heaven, or God just takes us to heaven, and, and, and all of that. No, there's more to us than just going to heaven. All right? There's more to us than going to heaven. We know that when you follow Jesus Christ, when you are a passionate, consistent follower of Jesus Christ, guess what happens? Jesus makes your life better. You cannot experience Jesus Christ and follow Jesus Christ in the reality of following Jesus Christ and you will remain the same or your life will remain the same.
Jesus makes life better. Now, does it mean that when I say Jesus Christ makes life better, you're not going to be in the valley sometimes and in the, in, in the, uh, in, you know, on, on, on the mountaintop sometimes? No, you are going to be there. But the thing that we know is this. Yea, do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. You know why? Jesus is with me. Yes. So all the rough patches in the valleys, Jesus makes them beautiful. Amen. When I'm on the mountain top and things are going and they are rosy, Jesus makes me appreciate the mountain top. Jesus makes life better. And in a Jesus community, we cannot live without being passionate about Jesus Christ. From the book of John 8, what did Jesus, what did God, what did Jesus say from the book of John 8? And that is what it means to be a disciple. That is what it means to be a follower, a passionate follower of Jesus Christ. Jesus in the book of John 8, 31, said, if you continue in my word, not if you just believe in me and you just stop there. No, he said, if you continue in my word. Uh, Jesus said to the people who believed in him, did you see that? They believed? Yeah. Did you see that? Yes. He said, Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you have to go to the next step. No, that, I added that to it, right? So it's, it's not <laughs> Jesus said to those who believe in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. And the first Jesus community we saw in scripture in uh, uh, Acts 2, what did the Bible tell us about them? The Bible told us that they continued in the apostles' doctrine. The apostles' doctrine simply means the commandments of Jesus. You know why they call it the apostles' doctrine at that time? Because at that time, there was no compilation of scriptures. All right? There hadn't been a compilation of scripture when that community started. So they said they continued in the apostles' doctrine, and the apostles took their doctrine from Jesus. All right? So what am I saying? Is that the very first example of the Jesus community we see, or we saw in scripture, or that we see in scripture, has to do with them committing to discipleship. It's them committing to continue in the apostles' doctrine. And then we see it in another Jesus community. The efficient church, or the efficient Jesus community, let me put it that way. In the book of Acts, Paul, we heard the story of Paul. When the Bible was talking about Paul, he said he went and took these guys and opened a place in the, the, the common place, which is called the school of Tyrannius. And guess what they were doing? For two years consistently, every day, they were following the word of God. They were following the teachings of the word of God. Now, am I saying come to church every day? That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying there has to be, you see, when you see scriptures like this, when you see scriptures like that says, you know, uh, they, they do it every day, it's not saying you should do it every day. But it is just telling you that there's a, a, uh, there's a, there's a, measuring, there's a measuring scale for the level of commitment that they have. That you can go, that you can, that you can copy, or you can look into. All right. So they went every day for two years. Now that did not stop. If you go to Acts, uh, Acts twenty, Paul was telling them. Paul was telling you know the 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 efficient elders. All right. He was leaving. He had been run. They ran him out of town. You know uh, because they had problems with him teaching and you know and the effect of Jesus Christ within the community, and they had him teaching and all of that, and they ran him out. When they ran him out, Paul now wanted to do his farewell, give his farewell message to the uh, efficient elders, elders of the church. So he met them at an island called Melitos, and in Melitos he was telling them one of the things that he told them. He said, I want you to know that I have not kept anything from you. How I have taught you from house to house. What is that telling us? That is telling us that apart from being taught in the general assembly every day, they also have meetings from house to house. In other words, there was such a commitment to discipleship that they wanted to do all that they can do to be able to be those disciples that will work with Jesus Christ or consistent follower of Jesus Christ. Now, quickly. When you are a committed follower of Jesus Christ or passionate follower of Jesus Christ, when that happens to you, a pattern begins to reveal itself. 
we begin to see a pattern. So in a Jesus community like this, when we're committed to following Jesus Christ, when we're committed and we're passionately following Jesus Christ, some particular patterns or what I call characteristics begin to reveal themselves. Okay? The number one characteristic that we see is that when people are in a Jesus community, when they follow Jesus Christ, guess what happens? Commitment shoots up. They begin to get committed. And guess what commitment is? Commitment is not just, um, uh, you know, I'm okay, um, I'm, I'm this. I remember a story that um, uh, perfectly describes commitment. Uh, the pig and the chicken were walking around the farm one day and they saw the farmer who was eating bacon and egg. And he was enjoying the bacon and egg. And the chicken was proud and he said, look, without me, this guy will not be able to eat this breakfast. He won't be able to eat this meal. And the pig told the chicken, he said, I agree, but to some extent. Why? Because you only gave a part of yourself for this man to enjoy. But I have to give all of myself. If I don't give all of myself, if I don't die, this is not going to happen. So what is commitment? It has to call, we have to, you know, we have to be sold out. It has been, it has been sold out to Jesus Christ and by extension to one another. So in a Jesus community, when we begin to follow Jesus Christ, guess what happens? We begin to be committed to God and we are committed to one another. We are committed to how everybody is moving on, how well everybody is doing. We are committed to the gospel. We are committed to how much uh, 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 the gospel is affecting our community and affecting our society. Uh, the church at Macedonia were so committed that they gave everything they had and even more. Paul said they gave everything they had and, they, and even more. In their despicable state, they were still able to give as much more than they could afford. You know why? They were committed. The Jesus community to them was not lip service. The Jesus community to them was as real as life. And because it was real, they were ready to give it what it took to move that community forward. Number two pattern that happens when you begin to see uh, uh, the, the, the Jesus community committed to uh, uh, following Jesus Christ passionately, the number two thing that, uh, that, that you begin to see, another pattern that you begin to see is that in a Jesus community that is pursuing discipleship and following Jesus Christ passionately, one pattern, another pattern you begin to see is the fact that they are great learners. They are great learners. If you are not thirsty for knowledge, I, I, I kind of doubt your level of, you know, commitment to Christ. You have to want to know who this Jesus is. Because Jesus is not a thing. Jesus is an embodiment of God. He is an embodiment of all things. The Bible says, in him does all things consist. And with Jesus having committed himself, why wouldn't you want to know him? Paul said that I may know him. He wanted to know him. He was never satisfied. Wrote more than half of, you know, the New Testament. But there was still this test and this quest and this, you know, desire and passion to want to know Jesus Christ. Because the more I go in, the more I want to get. The more I know him, the more I want to know him more. The number three, um, number three pattern. They are not just learners or people who just study or just want to know Jesus Christ. In a Jesus community, you begin to see people who are doers. 
they are doers. They are not just hearers alone. They are not just learners alone. They are people who are doing. So you see, you see scriptures littered with all these Jesus community. They are just so committed to doing what God wants them to do. They are doers, not lip service. And Jesus even told us, he said, you have to be doers, not deceiving your own self. If you just hear and you're not doing, he said, you have become a self-deluder, like somebody said. You begin to delude yourself. But in a Jesus community, we begin to see doers. Can you open to Philippians 2.12 for me? Philippians 2.12. Philippians 2.12. Look at what Paul said. Uh, let, me, let me get the NLT. Let's see what Paul said in the NLT. Okay. Dear friends, you always followed my instructions when I was with you. You always followed my instruction. And now that I am away, it is even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation. How do you show the results of your salvation? Can somebody read that for me? How do you show it? The next one? No, 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 no. Go back to 12. Yes, okay. With deep reverence and fear. In other words, it is in doing that we show the results of our salvation. And the results of our salvation, what Jesus has actually accomplished for us, is made manifest in our, you know, outwardly in how much we obey and we do the things of God. All right. When we follow Jesus in the Jesus community, these things begin to happen. This is where, you know, I'm beginning to round up. This is where the, uh, uh, the rubber begins to, to meet the road. When we follow Jesus Christ, as a Jesus community, what happens? We will begin to see maturity, number one. We will begin to see maturity. We will begin to see maturity. It is in discipleship that people become very matured. If you are not a disciple, you know, you're just, you know, all you just want is just to see the hand of God, what God can do for you, what is in need for me. Those are the kind of things. But when we begin to follow Jesus Christ, that is when we begin to see the fruits of maturity. And I want to say at this point that maturity doesn't mean perfection. You're not just, it doesn't mean you're perfect. It just means you are growing up. You are increasing in your discipline. And what is the, uh, for, for the purposes of this teaching, uh, the measuring stick of maturity, the measuring the yardstick of maturity is your decisions. How do you handle your decisions? Since you got born again, how do you handle your decisions? Right? And I'll give you the key. Pastor Ban gave me the key. We were in some kind of you know, sticky situation, and he told me, you remember, I don't know, you remember. He said, what is the righteous thing to do? That's how we ask the question. A mature Christian will always ask, what is the righteous thing to do? In this situation you are in now, what is the righteous thing to do? In other words, what is the Jesus thing to do? The Jesus thing to do is the righteous thing to do. Note, I did not say what is the right thing to do. There's a difference between the right thing and the righteous thing. If you don't believe me, let me give you scripture. John 8. From verse 1. The woman was caught actively in adultery. They, they caught her. She was, she was in the act when they caught her. It wasn't a rumor. <laughs> that we had a rumor that this thing, no, that's not it. She was, the, the Bible says she was caught, in, in King James says she was caught in the very act. What was the right thing versus the righteous thing to do? Jesus gave us the clue. All right? If they had stoned her, that would have been the right thing because the law supports that. All right. If they had stoned her, that would be the right thing. The law supports it. But the right thing is not always the righteous thing to do. And guess what Jesus did? Jesus did the righteous thing rather than the right thing by going a step ahead of the law and implemented 
the law of love. Every time you are faced with a decision to make, when your level of maturity kicks in, you begin to make decisions based on righteousness. What is the righteous thing to do in this situation? Yeah, I know somebody hurt you 10 years ago, but ask yourself, what is the righteous thing to do in this situation? I know you were not treated right, but in this situation, what is the righteous thing to do? You have to ask those questions. And when you ask those questions, those questions don't just come to you because you are Mr. Christian. It comes to you because you are maturing every time and every day. Old Testament, if it's okay, New Testament, Old Testament. We have somebody who is called King Solomon. And two women were arguing. One lost their child, one lost her child. She knew she, you know, she knew, you know, he was killed and all of that. But Solomon came with a level of maturity and a level of wisdom that was not seen before. And he was able to resolve that case. You know why? Because when God asked Solomon, God asked him, he said, what do you want me to do for you? Yes. Uh, for many of us, maybe me, I don't know if, you know, certain, you know I, 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 don't, I don't know what I would have said. Maybe I will, I will ask for... Maybe Tesla, thank you. <laughs> I probably would have asked for a Tesla. God, just give me, just create a Tesla and give me a chauffeur so that I can ride at the back and everybody will see what I look like and, and all that kind of, you know, all that kind of great stuff, you know. But Solomon, no, Solomon did not ask for that. Solomon said that your servant will have a wise and understanding heart to be able to do what? To be able to judge your people. That's maturity. That's maturity. Number two, when we begin to follow Jesus Christ passionately, guess the second thing that we begin to see? We will begin to conform to the image of Jesus Christ. We will begin to conform to the image of Jesus Christ. Uh, do, do I have my picture there? Where's, where's Mr. Lennon? Do I have my picture? The video, do I have it? We don't have it? Okay. All right. It's freezing? Oh, okay. All right. I wanted to show you a video uh, to illustrate, you know, um, what I was trying to say. And, but I will just say it this way. We begin to conform to the image of Jesus Christ. How do we know we are conforming to the image of Jesus Christ? Because we are beginning to see the fruits of the Spirit be made manifest in our lives. If you want to know what you are like, if you want to know how God perceives you or what, God's, what God wants you to do or God wants you to be like, begin to look at the fruit of the Spirit. God wants you to receive joy, to receive peace. And we can see that in the image of Jesus Christ. All right? And for the most part, many of us, when we see ourselves in the mirror, which is what I wanted to show, when we see ourselves in the mirror, we really don't know who we are. We really don't understand who we are. You know why? Because we are not familiar with, what, with all, who God has made us to be. And it is only in pursuing Jesus Christ that we become familiar with our real self, who God has made us to really be. And it is only in pursuing this that we can really, really, really come to the point where we can be familiar with ourselves and we're not fighting our own image. All right, all right. And then number three, number three, this will take me writing some things here, is that when we are passionate followers of Jesus Christ, when we're passionate followers of Jesus Christ, God begins to build understanding in us. We begin to understand things better. We begin to see things clearly. 
And understanding is one of the biggest things that we have. That's one of the, that's one of the things that causes confusion, especially in the Jesus community. Understanding. We see things differently. We understand things differently and all of that. When I was in high school, that's, what I, that's why I brought this here. When I was in high school, we used to make, uh, the, I don't know if it's a reality or if it's real or maybe it was a joke and all of that. And, um, but there were two guys who were friends. So we called them um, A and B. And they spoke different languages. All right? But in their language, there were some words that, you know, were the same. Same words. All right? So two words. Um, if, if you're a Yoruba person, you might understand one of the words, and you know, I won't mention the other tribe, all right? So, um, so um, OTA. And in this language, too, there's something called OTA, too. I won't mention, I won't call the word, just look at it this way. All right? The second word I want to talk about is. In this language, there's something called ADA. And this one too, there's something called ADA. So these guys were friends, and they wanted to introduce themselves. One wanted to introduce the other to uh, his dad. And the guy went to his house. So guy A went to guy B's house. Now, in the first language, this word means enemy. And this word means machete. All right? All right? In this second language, this one means friend. And this one means dad. Are you getting me so far? Yes, sir. This guy went to visit this guy, and he wanted to introduce him to his dad. And when he wanted to introduce him to his dad, the dad was nowhere to be found. So the guy yelled. Dad, where are you? My friend is here. He looked back, he saw his friend took off. You're not getting the joke, right? Same word, same spelling, but different meaning. Correct. This is endearing. He was so excited, running to call his dad. Dad, where are you? Where are you? And this, uh, my friend is here. Where are you? And this guy had, my enemy is here. Where's my machete? <laughs> So he took off, and this guy was confused. What is going on? I can't find my dad. My friend is running away. What is going on? Survivor. <laughs> People are the What? <laughs> what is this telling us? It tells us something. Because of where we're coming from. How we understand life, the things that have happened to us, our experiences, they all contribute to how we understand things. Even when we are saying the same things, we don't normally mean the same things. Are you listening to me? When we're saying the same things, we don't mean the same things. Why? Because our experiences are different. But guess what? When we passionately follow Jesus Christ, Jesus begins to unify our knowledge. He begins to unify our perception. He begins to unify our language. He begins to unify those points of confusion. Because why? I, like, like you know, I told you about, you know, uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. That's one of the books that really, you know, impacted me. And one of the things that he said, he said, seek to understand before you are understood. That's what Jesus will do for you. He will help you to be able to seek to understand. We're seeking to understand. You see, if you seek to understand people, why people do what they do, which is what our responsibility is in a Jesus community, we will stop judging ourselves. 
and our expectation of people becomes like the expectation of Jesus. You know why? Because Jesus is beginning to infuse our life with understanding. And we begin to see things just the way Jesus saw things. What is all this telling us? When we become disciples, we benefit with the power of understanding so that our language becomes unified. Our understanding becomes unified. We become, you know, uh, people that know one another. And with that, we can be able to defer to one another. And the, the problem is sometimes when people are not understanding you, you think they are dumb. No, they just don't understand you. The fact that I don't understand does not mean I'm dumb. The fact that I'm, I'm not understanding it just means we're not on the same wavelength. And I want us to know this and take this to heart. And finally, before I go and take my seat, please, I want you to know that all these things we are saying, they are for us to practice and to do. If we say all these things, we know all these things, we understand all these things, and we are not practicing them, Paul says we are self-deluding. And in a Jesus community, we don't want to be self-deluders. We want to be people who take the word of God and run with it because that is what God wants us to do and that's how we can attain to what God has created us to be. Thank you very much for listening to me all this while. God bless you.